Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We are very fortunate this evening. We couldn't have chosen two more dedicated and qualified persons to talk on this subject that hasn't received the amount of attention and consideration that it deserves. The topic, as you know, is violence, the outdated centerpiece of domestic and foreign policy. From 1978 to 2000, Stuart Reese was professor of social work and social policy at the University of Sydney. Prior to this, he taught at the University of Aberdeen and the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom, and you, you like this one, and at the University of Toronto and Wilfrid Laurier, no prizes for who, where that place is, at the University in Canada, two universities in Canada, and also at the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Texas at Austin in the United States. Professor Reese has received several awards, including a, a Simon Fellowship at the University of Manchester, a Humanities Fellowship at the City University of Hong Kong, an honorary doctorate and award of the highest honor for contributions to world peace, conferred in 1998 by Soka University, Japan. For four years, he was an elected fellow of the Senate of the University of Sydney. For six years, he was a member of the Aboriginal Reconciliation Council of New South Wales and is currently a council member of TODA research institute into global governance and human security. He chairs the Energy Council of the State of New South Wales. Professor Reese has been involved in community development, probation, services, and social work in the UK and Canada. He worked in the War on Poverty programs in the USA and the Save the Children non-government organizations in India and Sri Lanka. We all know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought there might have been a you know, is, is, he, is he getting red? Good to see him blush once He's been red for about the last 20 I'm, minutes. I'm going to talk about violence, not just simply direct violence, but what um, the peace theorist Galton calls uh, structural violence. In other words, the violence that's inherent in policies and the way institutions operate to ensure that large numbers of people never are able to uh, achieve their potential. So it's not not merely direct, uh, but also um, indirect. I'm going to talk a bit about for, about military policy, a bit about immigration policy, um, quite a lot about economic policy, the inherent violence in economic policies, and finally some observations about the violence inherent in attitudes towards the environment. The um, Australia's foreign policy, is really or its defense policy, is largely based on its uncritical alliance with the United States. So the United States comes up with the idea of the, the new US, US Pacific pivot, as it calls it, because it desperately needs an enemy. At the end of the, the Cold War, the, um, the idea that the Soviet Union, as it then was, is, was the enemy, is, disappears, and uh, <coughs> China is now regarded as the as the threat to, uh, to, uh, to the United States. And of course, Australia, by uh, lining up with this US um, uh, Pacific pivot in this part of the world, is, is treated as almost synonymous with uh, the United States. If you talk to Chinese diplomats, their argument is not that, um, not that Australia is seen as a base for American forces, but rather that Australia is an American base. So that, uh, and a great, our, our, our fascination with, when you, invent, when you look at the figures about the purchase of weaponry, you can see the fascination with, with force as a, as a major plank of um, a foreign policy. There's a brilliant historian uh, called the Ian Bickerton from the University of New South Wales, who a couple of years ago wrote a book called The Illusion of Victory. The, uh, he, and he traces the, the consequences of wars over, dec over centuries and decades and says that whatever the, um, it, it's inescapable, he said, that whatever the human, uh, that the human costs and the material costs of wars far outweigh any short-term gain that might have been acquired. And we're, we're sitting here today on the anniversary of uh, one of the most appalling uses of force, the dropping of the atomic bombs on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we still don't seem to have learned the lesson. 
but in and you can hear the rubbing of the rubbing of hands and the boasting that's going on the and going on the airwaves tonight as we boasted about um, the government's boasted about uh, the building of a new series of um, warships uh, in, uh, in in Adelaide. We, in fact, I was surprised to read from SIPRI, that's the, the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research, are the largest percentage purchaser of weapons from, we're the biggest customer for American weaponry. Uh, the same institute reports that in, in the five years up to 2013, there's been an 83% increase in Australian governments purchasing weapons from the United States. So. This, this idea that the use of force uh, to, solve, to solve problems, whether it's in the personal context of, of uh, domestic, of family life, or whether it's on the streets where you, men, men settle arguments with, with a knife, or whether it's uh, institutional violence of the kind that is um, being reported day after day by the Royal Commission. You can see there's, there's a direct link between the, the private problem and the public issue. And unfortunately, the, the, this fascination with, with force in, in, as, as defense policy has now become almost synonymous with our thinking about immigration policy, about the way to treat asylum seekers and refugees. It's no accident that a, a high-ranking uh, general or lieutenant general sits alongside the the uh, Minister for Immigration in Operation Sovereign Borders, as though we, uh, the, the, as though we are, we have to fear somebody. That our security is built on the, on the promotion of fear, the fear of the other. That Australian identity <coughs> only <coughs> is is um, sketched in and sustained not by what we stand for, but who we fear whether it was indigenous people, whether it was uh, Chinese gold prospectors, whether it was uh, Pacific Island cane cutters, whether it was Vietnamese boat people, or um, people who are not like us. You can see in the immigration policy a sort of re-emergence of the white Australia assumptions and values. And, and Cathy's already mentioned, I mean, it's bolstered by notions of secrecy and, and punishment. That seems to be to be central to the to the thinking. The secrecy is that uh, um, <coughs> you mustn't you mustn't encourage um, you mustn't encourage uh, people smugglers. So uh, we had the wretched Peter Dutton, <coughs> who uh, who his parents were I haven't got a clue. I know that he was once a um, a, a Queensland policeman, but but he was boasting today about how many boats we turned back to countries where there's almost a complete absence of um, any respect for human rights. So that, um, and, and the punishment has already been identified in Cathy's reference to the Border Protection Act, which the cowardly Australian Labour Party colluded with. I, it's almost unimaginable. What are they thinking of? This notion that um, doctors and nurses and social workers can be punished by up to two years of prison for reporting on on, abu uh, on, uh, uh, for, uh, on abuses that they may have seen in, in detention centres. Even the very notion that we should have fortresses on, in remote islands, in, in, uh, on Manus Island and Nauru, as a form of immigration policy, is just amazing. I'm about to go on a plane to fly to Jordan to go to the to the to the one of the biggest refugee camps in the world, where one of the poorest countries in the world without almost any water, has created a, of, almost overnight a town of, as I understand it, half a million people. And this, this rich, self-satisfied, insular country, uh, led by people who think that violence is the way to do things, we ought to be uh, uh, <coughs> manifestly ashamed of ourselves. <coughs> Uh, let me drift now into the, well, can I say that, um, that uh, as an antidote to this policy, we've, there's a book coming out next week, because we, we need to try to find what's the remedy, what's the prescription, Cathy's referred to, uh, to, to several ideas. This book is called Conversations in Peace, 
and dear Mari Bashir is going to launch it in Great Books at 6.30 on, on Tuesday of next week. It's, it's the, the, the contents are about the, the, the lectures of the first, first 14 people who received the Sydney Peace Prize. I mean, some great visionaries, people like Archbishop Tuntu Muhammad Yunus, uh, Patrick Dodson, uh, the wonderful Arundhati Roy, and so on. So there's, there's, there's an antidote available. Let me drift now from immigration policy and that, that um, quick commercial to um, <clears throat> my concern that economic policies are inherently violent. Uh, it's this reverence for the market, the uncritical reverence for the market that is the problem. There are three pillars to these, to these um, uh, economic policies. The first is about the privatization of the public sector, and Cathy's referred to that with the astounding figures, which I didn't know about, concerning the, our, our due respect for, for private jails. The second pillar is about the, um, the uh, deregulation of the corporate sector, giving them almost a blank check to do what they like. And the third pillar is the constant concern to reduce income tax, to reduce corporate tax, and with the money saved from, uh, and, and to pay for those policies, by cutting back on public services. That, because it's an easy formula, that even, such an easy formula that even Joe Hockey can, doesn't forget it and keeps, and keeps repeating it. And with that, with that policy comes the, the resurrection or the, the commitment to increasing inequality. With that policy come all the pathologies of inequality, which, with, with this massive inequality, that is a guarantee of violence. It's, the, it's, it's, the, it's, an, it's an incendiary situation. You can see it in particular in America, which is, uh, which, where, the, where the inequalities are just um, obscene. So you've got all the pathologies of, of um, inequality associated with economic policies, poverty, homelessness, mental illness, alcoholism, and so on. And um, uh, there doesn't seem to be, uh, there doesn't, because the, because the formula is apparently easy, there doesn't seem to be any undue criticism of that, uh, of that uh, process. It's a process that's been going on for hundreds of years. Adam Smith warned about it in The Wealth of Nations. At the end of the 18th century, there was a wonderful English poet called Oliver Goldsmith. He wrote a long poem called The Deserted Village. And The Deserted Village was about precisely what's happening to the unemployed, the underemployed of the homeless now. Ill fares the land, he said, till, till homeless ills are prey where wealth accumulates and men decay. And so you've got the you can hear that in the discussion about whether we, we don't really want to de deal with negative gearing. We don't really want to deal with privileged people like me who have generous superannuation and are not, entitled, not allowed to pay any tax on it. So, uh, and I'm, you know, uh, well, I won't say any more about that <laughs> at, at, at this point. So there's the, there's the, there's the pathological state of the, uh, of the economic policies. And the SOP to us, this is which, um, which um, uh, Rob, the Minister for Trade, keeps uttering, is that, well, we've passed these, these uh, free trade treaties with America and with China. But the wonderful Patricia Ranald, who's not here tonight, wrote an article in the Herald yesterday or the day before, warning that, of course, the, it's not about free trade at all. It's, if you look at the, 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 the outcomes of the NAFTA, the, the North American Free Trade Treaty with Mexico and Canada, God knows I was in on it, it must have been about 15, almost 20 years ago now. It's about the production of monopolies and oligopolies. Mm. It's about, the, uh, about 50 major corporations benefiting enormously. Mm. It's about whether the, 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 the Chinese coal mine coal mining company that may be allowed to build, to, to uh, have an open cut mine on the Liverpool Plains can subsequently, if it's, if it's refused permission, can actually sue the, the, the New South Wales state government. And that, and wherever the, wherever the extractive industries have not got their way, um, 
the, the, these free trade treaties give them, it looks to me, uh, look, give them a carte blanche to, uh, to challenge, to challenge, um, uh, to challenge governments. So the, the, the free trade is actually, it's not free at all, it's about the protect, it's about government by corporations. Mm. And some years ago, we, I, together with a colleague, we did a book called um, Human Rights Corporate Responsibility, in which we tried to plot on a continuum whether the attitude of corporations to human rights. And most of them, at one end of the continuum, said it's none of our business. There was a few in the middle who wanted to have 50 cents each way and said, well, when it's relevant to us, if we get caught out, then we'll pay, we'll pay attention to human rights. And there were very few who said that business has to be synonymous with human rights. That's part of, of the education process that has to occur. The final comments I want to make are just very briefly about um, the attitude towards the environment. You saw the wonderful, perhaps the best social commentator in, in Australia, from the most consistent one, is, the, is uh, Moyer, the cartoonist for the Sydney Morning Herald. There's that wonderful picture today or yesterday of, of where all the other uh, nations, major nations, China, United States, and so on, are, are saying, yes, we realize the huge, and, and the Pope, we realize the huge crisis that is uh, environment, the need for environmental protection. We cannot continue to live in the way we do. And uh, there's a picture of, uh, of Abbott as Popeye saying that, you know, my, it's only my word is against yours, against all, all the other nations of the world. For too long, Australia has regarded itself as just, just a quarry where you could dig everything up or cut everything down or almost fish things to extinction. So that's a very aggressive, bullying, violent attitude towards what the first astronauts called a fragile life support system. When they look back on Earth, if we only thought of it as a precious, uh, fragile life support system, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have the, um, uh, the, the policies that, 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 uh, that we have. Uh, what to do, uh, how, to, how to challenge this inherent violence in military policy, in immigration policy, in economic policy, in environmental policies. I think we have to talk about socialism. I think the, the, uh, we, we, we clearly have to um, talk about non, the, the language and the philosophy and the practice of non-violence. We clearly have to talk about our obligation to to people who are not yet born. And, the, and we, we, the point at which, in economic policy terms, we've regarded patients and students as mere commodities, that's, that, there's a real problem. Uh, I've always regarded the centerpiece of social justice, the major centerpiece, as a responsibility never to, never to make commercial gain out of people being sick. Um, around the world, the, the availability of universal health insurance, absolutely, for me, the central plank of the, build, of the building and the rebuilding of the civil society. And you can see the, the terrible problems that Obama has had in the United States in, um, uh, in getting, in getting um, Obamacare, uh, not only onto the statute book, but thank goodness and surprisingly, the Supreme Court ruling that it, that it should stay there. There was a poem by uh, an Irishman called Louis McNeese, it's called Prayer Before Birth, in which he anticipates the very problems we're, we're talking about tonight. And he imagines the, the world that, that, that the newborn would, in, would inherit, and the fear they have of the kind of um, violence of this one-dimensional way of thinking about power that um, that, uh, that person faced. I'm not yet born uh, protect me against those who with walls, tall walls will wall me, with strong drugs will dope me, with wise lies will lure me. I'm not yet born, protect me against those who would freeze my humanity, would dragoon me into a lethal automaton, a cog in a wheel, a person with only one face. And uh, I think I'll rest my case there. <laughs>